This program was recorded with a live audience. Please forgive the occasional sound fluctuations. Hay House is proud to bring you a man whose best sellers include your erroneous zones, the sky's the limit, pulling your own strings, you'll see it when you believe it, and his most recent book titled Real Magic. Here's Dr. Wayne Dyer. Thank you. God bless you. It's nice to be with you. Actually, what I want to talk to you about in the limited time that I have, and it will go by in a moment or two, uh, is, uh, is something that is very profoundly a part of my life and has been for the past couple of years. It is, uh, it is something that I uh, have been experiencing uh, since I wrote uh, the last book that I published, Real Magic, last summer. And um, some very strange and wonderful things have been happening uh, in my life in uh, this period of time. And uh, when I finished uh, uh, writing, uh, you'll see it when you believe it, and it published that, and I felt that I, it was my effort to sort of unmuddle the metaphysical and make it available to all of us, and not some esoteric practice that uh, you have to sit in a cave and figure out for yourself, that it's something that we can all apply and live with every day in our lives. I really thought that I was through with uh, writing for a while, um, and had decided to, uh, to do some other things in my life to uh, go into disguise almost, to disappear. And uh, I've taken, I had taken up this practice of meditation oh, now five or six years. And what happens when you get on this path is that uh, you think that you're sort of in charge of your life, you know? <laughs> and uh, you think that you're doing it. I remember reading Carl Jung's great line, um, and he said that at the same moment, you are the protagonist in your own life and you're making choices. There's also a paradox. He said that at that very same moment, you are also the spear carrier or the extra in a much larger drama. And uh, he said you are, he put it this way, which is really the ultimate paradox, you are doomed to make choices. Uh, so there's really sort of a self-canceling statement in there. If you're making choices, then how could all the choices be made? And I talked to Ramdas about this, and he said it's the uh, reason for the smirk on the face of the Buddha. <laughs> you know, if you can get that paradox figured out, that yes, indeed, you do have a free will, and you are making choices, and they're all being made for you all at the same time. It's like living with those opposites and cleaving those, uh, you know, that dichotomy. It's a very powerful notion. But what happens is that you get on this path and uh, you start moving along, and I uh, didn't really want to take the time to face 500 empty pages again, uh, because I don't write books like most people do. I, uh, they all come right out of inside of here. I don't go to the library and spend a lot of time looking up what other people have said about it, uh, and then putting it in different words. I, uh, it comes out of my consciousness somehow. And it became very evident that uh, I was to write about uh, this thing called miracles, about creating miracles. And what I have written about and what I'm sharing with you here today is exactly what I am doing here on this stage right now. Um, it is something that I'm going to ask you to take a real hard look at in just an hour's time or so. And that is, um, how can you surrender? and let go and become detached from the outcome and the stuff that you seek after in your life, how can you do that and still have the things that you want come into your life? How does that paradox work? One of the things that I have learned in my own speaking is to let go of the outcome, to be unconcerned with the uh, the reaction and what's in it for me, and indeed to uh, just surrender. And in my meditation before I speak, I always repeat the mantra endlessly over and over again, and I find myself doing this more and more in my life, and something that I urge you to do. Um, I ask the question, how may I serve? Just 
how may I serve? How may I serve? How may I serve? There are a thousand people there. Uh, how may I serve them? How may, it's like getting the focus off of what's in it for me and how do I look and whether I say the right thing and whether people like what I say and whether they buy things that I have or whatever. And instead, like letting all of that go, just letting that go and getting the focus of your life, the centeredness of your life on, on this business of serving. And the irony of it is, is that when you get to that point where you're able to do it and let go of that outcome, all of the stuff that you chased after and worked so hard for and figured you had to have back here begins to chase after you and show up in your life. And it isn't any, you're no longer on the treadmill. It's like a surrendering. And so that's what I do when I come on stage. And it's almost as if God uh, uh, says to me, it's like, um, as long as you stay on purpose, you'll never stumble. And you'll know what to say. And when you get off of that, when you shift your alignment away from that, then you won't be able to do what you're doing. And the same thing happened in the writing of this uh, Real Magic. For the first time in my life, I experienced what, has become, what I have come to call automatic writing where I left home and uh, went off to uh, Maui and sat down and, uh, uh, and in eight weeks' time just uh, produced this book without any struggle whatsoever, not one moment of struggle. And it just seemed to be there and it seemed to flow. And I can type, like uh, when I s sit down and type uh, a letter or a contract or anything that I might have to put out on a typewriter, I'm one of these kind of typists. I, I just look around. I can do it rather quickly, but I have never had the formal training in typing. But when I write at this little typewriter, I can go along and close my eyes and write at 70 and 80 words a minute when you get into that automatic. And I can't, I can't tell you how I do that. It just, and I can, my wife will walk by where I'm writing because I rent my own little place and she can walk by and tell when I'm writing and when I'm just, uh, resting. And um, she'll walk by and she'll say, it must, the typewriter must have been smoking. You were going so fast. And it was like that for eight weeks of time, just because I had completely let go. And I wasn't concerned with whether the editors liked it, how it came out, whether or not it was a bestseller, whether people were going to buy it, whether the reviews were going to be, nothing. It was like very, very peaceful. And it's a very peaceful place that I'm asking you to to uh, look at and get to in your own life. Just before I left for uh, Australia a couple weeks ago, I was on, the, uh, uh, on a show on CNN called Sonia Live, and Sonia and I were, went to school together. I mean, we've been friends forever. And uh, we sat down to, to do the interview, and she said to me, Wayne Dyer, it says here that, um, that you haven't had a cold in 15 years. She said, uh, now I've known you for a long time. She said, very frankly, I don't believe that. Now well, that's Sonia. That's the way she works. That's fine. I love Sonia. Um, and there was a time when if somebody said that to me on national television, I would say, well, wait a minute. I'm gonna, now I, I have to defend myself. And I got, you get into that position of, I'm gonna call my doctor right now or whatever and, and start defending yourself. Um, and when you get to be free, you don't need to defend yourself. You know. You just have this knowing. And I said, that's all right if you don't believe it. And I said, ne like, next question. <laughs> there was no anxiety about it. There was no, I don't care if millions of people are watching. It doesn't make any difference. I'm not attached to any of that. It's like, I know. I know that I don't get those things, and it's fine if you don't believe it. You don't have to. I'm not living my life for that reason. It's like being self-referred rather than object-referred. And I can do the same thing even with criticism. There was, you know, I now get letters, when I get letters of criticism, which you do, which everyone does, and I even tell my, my, uh, my own uh, children over and over again when they worry about their reputation and all that, I say, forget your reputation. You know, it's not located in you. You go out and give a talk to a thousand people, you leave, you have a thousand reputations. What am I gonna do, follow every one of you home? <laughs> Did you like me? Did you think I was all right? What did you think? Did you? Some will think great, some not. Some will think, well, he's, you know, he's got more hair than Bernie. So I'm going to say, well, maybe he gave his head, you know.
You can't be consumed with that. I say, the only thing I tell my children is forget about your reputation because it's not located in you, and if it's not located in you, let it go. Don't be attached to that. But you can be concerned with your character, with who you are, and just be that and get your life on purpose. Now, I must say to you very frankly that I wasn't always this way, particularly about criticism. Now when I get letters of criticism from people, I send them a free book. <laughs> Another one. You know, or flowers, or uh, I just, I don't get, I don't find myself needing to uh, defend myself. I didn't always do that. For 10 years, but after I wrote Erroneous Owens and Pulling Your Own Strings, 10 years, I used to have a form letter that I would send to anybody who wrote me a nasty letter. <laughs> then I would just sign my name at the bottom, and I got it from H.L. Mencken, who was a great satirist of the early part of this century. And he had this wonderful, and I thought, what a great idea. So I would write this letter. It said, uh, I am sitting here in the smallest room in my house with your letter in front of me. Soon it will be behind me. And then I would sign my name. <laughs> so I must not still be in the place I'd like to be because I still find that kind of funny, you know. <laughs> but I stopped doing that a few years back. So this surrendering process is, uh, uh, is really just crucial in what I'm going to ask you to do. See, um, I am in the process now of uh, putting together in my own mind ideas for something I'll probably write a year or two from now. Uh, and I want to share it with you here this evening, and I haven't uh, shared it too much in public because uh, I'm working on it in my own life. Um, and it's this, like, if you really want miracles to uh, show up in your life, you have to... Uh, you have to be able to do these three things, right? And I'm going to just sort of, uh, there will be three, but I'll probably get to the third one two minutes before uh, I finish. But it's okay, because the first one is the, is, is the toughest for people. And I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, and this three-part sort of paradigm is what I think of as the, uh, the secret formula to, create, to manifesting miracles in our lives. See, I began to write about miracles, not because I thought it was time to write another book, but because I couldn't stop myself from doing it. It's, all, it's the only thing, real magic is the only thing that I've ever written that I don't take credit for, that I really feel was uh, written through me. Uh, that I was a messenger in this case. And it was, uh, and so as I talk about it around the world now, about uh, this business of being able to create uh, something for yourself that is truly miraculous, um, what I'd like you to do is to just get a picture in your own mind of uh, what it is that would constitute a miracle for you. You know, something that you may have walked in here today uh, not believing was possible for you to do, or in order for it to occur, it would uh, require some kind of special divine intervention or some kind of luck or great happenstance and all the cosmic dice would all have to flow it's exactly right perfectly uh, in order for it to occur I'd like you to just be able to, uh, to just picture what that is and it could be anything I mean there might be people in here uh, most of us when we finish today will get up and walk out and go to our cars and drive home there are some who will not walk out there are some who've been in a wheelchair for uh, you know for the last whatever, and to just stand and walk would indeed constitute a miracle. So your miracle may not be somebody else's. For some, it may be an enormous healing to be able to rid ourselves of something that we have uh, believed was not possible. Certainly after hearing Bernie Siegel, you would, uh, you would begin to doubt whether or not there was anything that was impossible in the way of healing. In touring with Australia, I spent uh, the last uh, 11 or 12 days with Deepak Chopra uh, and Stuart Wilde, the three of us, toured uh, these, uh, these cities. 
and Deepak's message. And he and I have teamed up on some tapes now and some, uh, and some writing projects and so on. Um, gives us an indication that within each one of us is an enormous power that I'll be talking about shortly. And your miracle might involve something to do with uh, well, relationships, or with manifesting prosperity, getting the right job, losing the one you got, getting the right partner, getting rid of the one you have, uh, <laughs> moving, raising your talent level, getting the right connection, whatever it may be. Just sort of uh, get a picture of it. And, and the first of these three things for this paradigm for miracle making, I call banish the doubt. That's Roman numeral one, even if you're not writing, or if you're listening on tape. Banish the doubt. Most of us have been raised on doubt. Most of us have been raised to believe in what we can't accomplish in order to be able to get to the stage of creating for ourselves this area that I call real magic, you have to get rid of the doubt that it's possible for you. And this I spend the most time on because it is the most difficult for us because uh, we somehow haven't got within us this knowing that uh, we are divine that we are capable and that we can create for ourselves virtually anything that we want to. You see, there's two parts to this physical journey, obviously. There's the physical part, which was handled for you in an instant, you know, in one split second, one microsecond, one drop of human protoplasm collided with another, and everything you needed for this physical journey was handed to you. It's just like... And there you are, out of something, out of nothingness. Your life is what I call a parenthesis in eternity. It opens parentheses at the instant of your conception, and it closes parentheses at your death. And it's surrounded by eternity. And when your life opened parentheses, everything that you needed in that tiny little microsecond was handled for you. And then there's the part of you that has been watching this whole journey. There's the eye. I heard someone saying at an airport the other day uh, that someone bumped up to them and he said, watch out, that's my arm here bumping. And I stopped to think about that and I wondered now, whose arm is that really? I mean, if you say this is my body, whose body is it? I mean, are you your body or are you the owner of this body or are you the observer of this body? There's this, ah, it's like I, I have the sentence, I was saying to myself. Well, there's two people in that sentence. <laughs> there's the I, who is saying, and then there's the physical, who is the self. So I am speaking here today in terms of creating miracles about the I, the owner, the observer that invisibleness that is inside this physical package, this ghost in the machine, that you can never escape. You see, when the moment before you die, you close parentheses, if they were to just like uh, come in and bring in a big scale, like this cosmic scale, you know, put everybody on it just before they didn't weigh you, you know, and then an instant after you die, then they weigh you again. Now here's you when you're alive and it weighs say 150 pounds and here's when you're gone and it weighs the same. It weighs 150 pounds, but it's not you. I mean, it's just something that they're gonna burn <laughs> or they're gonna bury, it's gonna be worm food. I mean, they wouldn't treat you that way. <laughs> they wouldn't burn you, would they? I mean, there's laws against that. <laughs> so, who you are, I mean, what it is that constitutes your very life is weightless. You can't weigh it. You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't get a hold of it. It's like you can go in and do an autopsy on anyone, and you can find the command center inside of you that says, I think I'll wiggle my finger. And you say, I'm going to wiggle my finger. And you go, and you go wow. Where's the command center that allows that to happen? And you cut open the brain, and you look in the nervous system, and you find the cortex, and you find the cerebellum, and you look for the synapses and the neurons and the connectors, and you say, this is it. And the scientists are pretty sure about this. This is it. 
This is the command center that says where this is all allowed to take place, where you do all of your thinking. But there's no autopsy on this planet that can ever reveal the commander in the command center <laughs> who says, I think I'm going to wiggle my finger. Well, this is my arm, or this is my life, or I think I'd like to have a miracle. That part of you, which is the part of you that creates your entire life, is uh, the part where the doubt is. And banishing the doubt really means coming to a full and complete awareness that you are not a human being having a spiritual experience but indeed that it's the other way around. That every single one of us are spiritual beings having a human experience. And the quality of that human experience in the physical world is dependent exclusively upon how we connect with and use that invisible part of ourselves. That part that you cannot find in an autopsy, that part that you cannot weigh, that invisibleness that is always with you, that is the observer. And you've got to get really comfortable with this observer. And you've got to understand the seven words, I think, that were most important ever strung together came out of Proverbs in the Old Testament. As you think, so shall you be. As you think, so shall you be. Now, it doesn't say, as you be, so shall you think, even though that's how most of us run our lives. Those words are really all out crucial because once you get it and understand that what you think about is what expands, as you think, so shall you be, is what rules the universe, once you know it, not just believe it, but once you know it, then you start getting real careful about what you think about. Real careful. Because all of those thoughts, all of those doubts, are the things that will manifest themselves into your life. Now, it's real simple matter to shift around and begin to pay attention first to the spirit, the invisible side of you, and secondly, to the physical part of you. Most of us don't do that. And it's such a simple matter. I can give you a, just like a real brief example of how it works. Most of us are as you be, so shall you think kinds of people. So that when things happen to us in the physical world, whatever they may be, we allow our inner world to be affected by them. And so between uh, my office and my home, it's a 17-mile drive that I make every day, twice a day. Now, there was a time when I would get in my car, when I was an as-you-be, so-shall-you-think kind of person, when I didn't understand the simple words that James Allen wrote in the last century when he said, circumstances do not make a man, they reveal him. The circumstances of our life reveal the kinds of choices that we've been making. And I used to get in my car and drive to my home, and depending on upon how the traffic went, or whether there was construction, or whether there were delays, or whether there were difficulties, or struggles, or problems, I would then allow my mood at home to be determined by that. And then I learned how to shift that, and how to first begin to visualize in my mind what it is that I wanted this trip to be like for myself. And I do this every day now before I get in the car. I get a picture of how it's going to be in the next half an hour. Very peaceful. It takes me about a minute and a half. Two or three deep breaths. This is going to be a peaceful, wonderful trip home. I'm not going through any yellow lights. The little lady who drives that 1977 Cadillac in the left-hand lane, she's had the seat removed from her car. 
She sits on the floorboard, and you can just see this little head sitting up there. She has signed an oath to drive around aimlessly, delay me. She's in divine order. <clears throat> She's exactly where she belongs. I'm going to bless her today instead of being mad at her. I'm going to understand that this is a perfect universe and that it's all in order and that I don't have to rush. And if there's construction, it's supposed to be there. There's no accidents. There's no accidents. And I'm going to take my time and I'm just going to be very peaceful all the way home. As you think, as you think, so shall you be. And then I get in the car and there she is, sure enough, about two miles from the house. And I waved, and I thank you for being here. If I were to try to go around you like I used to, I would probably have a head-on collision, or there's an officer there to give me a traffic ticket or whatever. I bless you for being there. And I get home, and I don't go through any lights, any yellow lights. Don't rush. Don't change lanes. Very peaceful. And I get home at the same time every day. Same time as I used to, only I'm now allowing myself to understand a very simple premise. I learned it from uh, a good friend of mine. His name is Edgar Mitchell. Edgar is a man who uh, was the, the Apollo uh, 14 commander in 1971. He's a neighbor of ours, and we have dinner a couple times a month. And my wife, uh, Marcy, and uh, Edgar's wife, Sheila, are very close friends, and we spend a lot of time with him. And I was talking to Edgar one time about um, what was it like to be on the moon. Because for me, whenever I meet anybody uh, who's, got, who's very unusual or done un, un, things that very few people have ever done, he's one of 12 human beings in the history of, the, of, uh, of humanity to walk on the moon. So I want to know about what that's like. And he told me about this experience he had. He called it a satori, which is where I got the idea to write about that in Real Magic. Everything I needed just showed up for me. It always just... When I would when I would need information about a certain area, I would be just slightly wondering where I should go, and the mail would be there, the book would be there, the conversation would be there. It was like that kind, that's what happens when you get to this surrendering place. And he told me about being, you know, this is a guy who's got a PhD from MIT in nuclear physics. That's as left-brained as it gets, okay? <laughs> and he said he was walking on the moon, and he looked to his left, and he could see an infinity of heavenly bodies hurling through space at thousands of miles per hour. And he looked to his right, and he could see this blue quarter, which is what the Earth looks like from the surface of the moon, a blue quarter. And he said he realized that on this blue quarter was all of the problems we've ever had in the history of the whole planet. Every single problem we've, is on this little blue quarter, one little sort of dot in another infinity of them hurling through space. All of your struggles, all of your problems, all of your worries, whether, you know, everything that you're concerned about, been on, and everybody else, Genghis Khan, Adler the Hun, and Napoleon, all of them, all, of them, all on this quarter. And he said he had this, this uh, what we call, what they call in Zen, a satori, an instant awakening. And in this instant awakening, he realized that this is an intelligent system that we're all a part of. There's an intelligence to this system. It's not some accidental fluke. And, he, and I said, Edgar, wouldn't you think that you would have been aware of that before you got in the capsule? <laughs> <You know that? laughs> he said, no, we had always been taught that we were to master it rather than to, become in, to get in harmony with it. And he said, that instant changed his life forever. And he left the space program, the Apollo program, when he came back. And he founded the Institute for Noetic Sciences and has been lecturing all around the world about the spiritual consequences of space travel mm -hmm. and what it, how it can really dramatically affect your life when you get out there and see that this is an intelligent system that we're all a part of. And if you know that, if you know that this is an intelligent system that we're all a part of, then you know that your life is also a part of that intelligence. And that the same intelligence 
that flows through those planets and allows, allows them to align and allows the galaxies to stay in place and allows us to move at thousands of miles per hour, which we're all doing right now. Even though our senses tell us something different. We're all hurling through space at thousands of miles per hour. As Einstein said, all things, you know, it's like it talked about relativity. It's all, it's all relative. Nietzsche had a great conundrum that'll help you to understand Einstein's theory of relativity. He said, all things being relative, what time does Munich stop at this train? <laughs> that'll get you going. So this intelligence, this divine intelligence, that this invisibleness, this uh, organizing intelligence that flows through everything is also flowing through you and through everything. It's not like there's a separate intelligence for you and a separate one for me, a separate God for you and a separate God for you. It isn't like that. This is a una, one verse song, a one song, a una verse. It's all one. And there's an intelligence about it all. And so in order to be able to banish the doubt about your capacity to manifest miracles for yourself in your life, you have to know that your life is a part of this intelligence and that it, like everything else, from the tiniest little microscopic dot to the galaxies and the cosmos, all has a purpose. There's a purpose to it all. And now when you get that and banish the doubt, you begin to realize that everything that has happened to you up until this moment, right now, is a part of that intelligence. It's all part of that. See, what you have to learn is that, I, I read a wonderful line when I was down in Australia by an actress uh, who was talking, and she concluded it with, she said, if you want to make God laugh, tell her your plans. <laughs> See, God's plan works, essentially, and yours doesn't, basically. It's like becoming a spiritual being really means shifting away from your plans and allowing yourself into this divine perfection. And when you do that, one of the first things that you do is you let go of everything that ever happened to you up until now as being anything other than perfect. See, if, you, if your life has a heroic mission, and it's a part of this intelligence, and it showed up out of nothing, you see, a heart starts beating inside of a mother's womb six or seven weeks after conception, and it's a total, complete mystery to everybody on the planet. We have no idea where that life was before, what it is, what, how it's going to become, what it is. I hold my little boy's hand up. He's five years old now, and his hand is like, oh, about a third the side of mine. And I look at his hand, and I say, you know, it's not like that hand is going to grow and become the size of mine. I mean, it isn't going to grow. He's going to need new bones in there. <laughs> he's going to need a whole new hand, isn't he? It isn't what he's got is just going to get bigger. That has to die, and it has to be replaced and replaced and replaced and replaced. And eventually, he'll have a hand like this. And it's going to come out of what? You know, this is the 1993 model of Wayne Dyer that you're looking at here today. It's very different than the 1958 model that graduated from high school. As a matter of fact, that model in 1958 is dead. Every single cell in it is gone and died and been replaced and replaced and replaced and replaced. I don't have one cell, not one molecule left in me that was there before. You can't find any of it. It's all new. And yet here I am with some knowings that I had back then. The knowings that I have are not physical in nature, they're metaphysical, they're beyond the physical. Someone defined life with a great definition as a sexually transmitted, incurable disease. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it just keeps dying and dying, and proof of life after death is that you're here today. So you don't need any more proof than that. The whole physical you has gone many times, and yet here you are. And why would you think that when it leaves for what you think is the last time, that life itself, this invisibleness that has no boundaries and no form, wouldn't 
proceed and continue. You can't kill that which has no boundaries, can you? Getting to this awareness that your life has a mission means that everything that has happened to it up until now was leading you to that mission. So that all of the people that you blame and all of the things that you think shouldn't have happened or wouldn't have happened or couldn't have happened, all of that is just a lot of nonsense. It all did. And even the abuse and the struggle and the tough times and the fact that your mother liked your sister better, even if you don't have a sister, she wanted one, she would have liked her better, you know, blame her for that. You're a middle child, you're a youngest, you're the oldest. You're, it's like you signed up for all of that. I mean, it's a nice way to look at it. Let's just get back of it and say, hey, I signed up for all of this. Even the abuse, even the tough things. I spent the first 10 years of my life in an orphanage. And in those 10 years, I was moved around to a lot of strange places. But I believe that for me, my purpose obviously is being, being actualized to this day. And it's about helping to teach people self-reliance and magic and miracles and, and a whole new way of looking at things. That's what my whole life is about. And you don't learn these things through instruction. You don't learn these things by somebody else telling them to you. You've got to learn them through the direct experience of it. It's almost as if God said, all right, here you are. You showed up and you want to teach people about self-reliance? Get your little ass into an orphanage for 10 years. <laughs> and learn how to do that. Learn how to rely on yourself. Become interdirected. Become self-directed. And don't complain about it and don't whine about it and, and find something beautiful in it. And that's what we do when we're children. We don't wake up when we're an orphan and when we're a child every day and say, oh my God, I'm an orphan again today. It's Wednesday. I was one yesterday, now it's tomorrow. When is this going to end? You don't do that. <laughs> You wake up and you deal with what you have to deal with. And you get on with your life. And now you can look back at your life, and most people look back at the experiences of their life and say to themselves, if only it would have been different. If only. And there is no if only in there. It was all in order. Life gives exams. Bernie and I and Joan had dinner together last night, and we were talking about the variables that we see in highly successful people. And we got to talking, and, and each one of us sort of told little stories about things that, about people we knew or about ourselves. And I, and I said, finally, I said, you know, there's, there's a thread that runs through all of this. There are people who go through life and have really tough experiences. Most of the time when you read about people who uh, abuse their children and you interview them, you find that, what? They were abused as children. I mean, it's something that you all know. You can shout it out. And then there are some who were abused as, as uh, a child. And I was one, not viciously, but uh, on some occasion. And while this is happening, you make an inner vow that this isn't going to be anything I'm going to partake in. And I would never do this to one of them. Like you learn from it or you repeat it. The highest functioning people take all of the things that happen to them. Like I, I spent a big hunk of my life around alcoholics. My father was an alcoholic and he finally left and abandoned us. My mother remarried 10 years later. Life gives exams. If you don't get it, she remarried my father in a different body. Another man who was abusive and abandoned and who, who was an alcoholic. Another man who was abusive and abandoned and who, who was an alcoholic. So I spent a lot of my younger years around that. And for me, it was easy. I saw what booze did to people and made the choice not to have that as a part of my life. Whereas my brother, who was with me through all of this, made the choice for many, many, many years to be an alcoholic. Like, you take the things that come along, and when you get to that spiritual place in your life, you begin to see that these things all have great lessons in them. And instead of saying to yourself, why is this happening to me? Isn't this awful? Poor me. You begin to say, what do I have to learn from this? Because you have banished the doubt that this is some sort of freak accident that you're in, and you begin to see that this is an intelligent system that you're all a part of. 
And understanding how to banish the doubt really starts with knowing the difference between that which you believe and that which you know. You see, all of the things that you believe, all of your beliefs, are handed to you throughout your life. They come from outside of you. So when you are born, and then you go to uh, you go to get into a family, and in that family you get you then you go to school, and you go through religious experiences, and you have all of your friends, and so on. And you're constantly being given a whole set of beliefs, and you can see the 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 real trauma of that on the planet today in Yugoslavia, in Herzegovina, and Bosnia, where young people are taught who they're supposed to hate from things that happened hundreds of years before, and the hatred is so bitter with people who don't, who've never even seen each other. They have this, you know, and you can see it in the Middle East, and you can see it, you can, you can see it virtually in all the places where there's these enormous conflicts. It's called prejudice, pre-judging. Right? So, in order to understand how to get past this, you have to understand there are some things that you believe, and there are some things that you know. Now, your knowings are different from your beliefs in that your beliefs are handed to you, your knowings all come from within. Everything that you know, you know because you got it yourself. No one handed it to you. Like, I watched uh, the uh, Winter Olympic trials a while back. And uh, when I was a young boy, I was going to become a, a hockey, uh, professional ice, ice hockey player. And I used to go skating every single day. And uh, then I let go of that when I was 18 and went into the service and spent some you know, years overseas and all of that and came out and went through all of the things of my life. And I get to now where I'm 52 years old and I'm watching the um, Winter Olympics with all of my children. And my children help me with humility. You know, I asked my 15-year-old daughter if she wanted to come and hear me speak. I said, I can get you tickets. There's thousands of people. They've actually paid to come and hear me speak. Would you like to come? She said, why? <laughs> so we're watching these, uh, and I get this all the time, all right? So we're watching the trials, and I say to my kids, we're all sitting there, and I say, yeah, I can do that. You see that Christy Yamaguchi over there? I can do those things. You can't do that, Dad. Come on. I say, yeah, I can do that. I used to be a great skater. I can twirl, and I can skate, and I can go backwards, and I can do figure eights and axles. I can do all of that stuff. I used to do all of that. Come on, Dad. You can't do that. I said, yeah, I can. I really can. So we have occasion to go to uh, up into Massachusetts, and I'm putting on my ice skates after 34 years. <laughs> Haven't been on skates in 34 years. And I lace up the skates, and I'm getting ready to go out there and skate, and, uh, and the kids are all like, oh, he's got to... And I go right out there, and within, within 15 seconds, I'm doing what I was doing 34 years ago. Skating, twirling, going backwards, doing all the things that were just second nature to me when I was growing up uh, in Detroit, down in the Detroit River. And the interesting thing is that the body that knew how to do that in 1958 is dead. There's not one cell left in it. Yet the knowing is still there. I don't have the same brain. I have different cells. I don't have the same femurs. I don't have the same ankles. I don't have, it's all different replaced. And yet the knowing is still there. You see, a knowing is metaphysical in nature. Somehow, beyond the physical, transferred to the physical through some process that we can't even begin to comprehend. The knowings that you have in your life, like I know I can swim, I know I can dance, I know I can make love, I know I can walk, I know I can uh, do all of these things that I, that I have a knowing about, all came from within you, and all of the things that you believe in were handed to you. So consequently, your knowings will never let you down in times of crisis, and your beliefs will almost always let you down in times of crisis. Those things that you believe in are handed to you, and those things that are handed to you come with doubt because someone else is giving it to you. This is what you're supposed to believe, this is what you're supposed to do, this is how you do it. Uh, yeah, that's great, and you're going to, but then there's a doubt attached to it. 
But that which you know isn't. Now, unfortunately, most of the things that we know as individuals also are in the area of what we know we can't do. We know what is impossible, what can't be done. So if I were to ask you, do you, can you be in more than one place at the same time? You know, can your body be here and can it be someplace else at the same time? You said, no, you can't do that. And if I said, well, could you transport yourself from here to, say, Montana or Spain just through the power of your mind? You'd say, no, you, you can't do things like that. And I said, well, can you enter someone else's dream? You know, go into dream consciousness from the waking, go into someone else's dream and become a character in their dream voluntarily. You say, no. no the, can you fly? If you come across a tree, can you jump over it? Can you levitate? Can you... There's a lot of things, and those are just some of the extremes. But I want to remind you of what one of our spiritual masters said to us through St. Paul. Even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. Even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. Just let that into your consciousness. Because now we're talking about someone who is changing shapes and raising the dead and feeding the hungry through the gift of manifestation of fish and loaves. Changing water into wine. The ability to be able to create a miracle mindset for yourself is not available to you if doubt is in your consciousness because what you think about is what expands. And if you have doubt, you will act on the doubt. You can't act on anything else. What you think about is what expands. The ancestor to every action is a thought. So if your thoughts are that this is not possible, that's what you will act on. Deepak uh, talks on these tapes that we put out about living beyond miracles about this placebo effect. And the interesting thing about the placebo effect is that if you give an individual a pill that is made out of sugar and you say to them, this pill is the latest cancer-curing drug, take it, that your body will begin to manufacture the anti-cancer agents from that pill. And if you take the very same pill and give it to someone else and say, this pill is the greatest ulcer-relieving pill that's ever been relieved, and you really know that that's to be true, you will start developing anti-ulcer with the same pill. And if you say that this is for the elimination of headaches, there's never been a greater headache remedy, and you know it to be true, your body will start to manufacture something different, different enzymes being created through the intention of no doubt. So that the physical world that you are in is capable of being shifted and manifested on the basis of a new awareness. As you think, so shall you be. Your thoughts will create an entirely new reality for you once you have learned to banish the doubt. Beliefs come from outside of you. Beliefs always let you down, and beliefs are intellectual acts. Knowings come from within. They will never let you down, and they are metaphysical cellular acts. You can have knowings in the physical domain, and you can have them in the metaphysical domain. Knowings, without doubt, about your spirituality and your ability to manifest what you want for yourself in your life. See, remember that even if you're sitting here with doubt this afternoon, there is still a doubter that you can never see. There's still, so the evidence that there's still an invisibleness there is here in the doubter. Not the doubt, but the person doing the doubting, that invisibleness. And that is what you have to learn to come in contact with. 
When I was writing the, um, the opening for uh, Real Magic, I looked for a, uh, a display quote. And the display quote that I picked for uh, this particular book uh, was written by a, uh, a scurvy elephant a poet named uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. For those of you who don't know what a scurvy elephant is, when I was in the third grade, I came home and asked Mrs. Scarf, what's a scurvy elephant? She was the lady who ran the orphanage. She was a saint. And she said, um, I don't know. I've never heard such, such a thing. And uh, she said, uh, why? And I said, well, I heard the third grade teacher telling the principal that Wayne Dyer was in her classroom and that he was a scurvy elephant. She said, yeah, I don't know. And she got on the phone and she called the principal and the principal said, no, that's Wayne. He mixes everything up. She didn't say that he was a scurvy elephant in her classroom. She said that he was a disturbing element in her classroom. <laughs> so I always pay homage to the scurvy elephants of the world because I've learned uh, that uh, there is probably a karmic debt that we all pay. And each one of us, as we are scurvy elephants in our own life, get a couple of them in our own families later on. <laughs> That's the one that you can do nothing with. <laughs> That's the one who's got a mind of their own, and no matter how much you cajole and punish and threaten and so on, they still have got their own mind. And you know, after a while, that you're wasting your time. You know, that's like you better stop and be at peace with this person and teach them harmony and maybe step back and learn something from them. One of the great karmic lessons that I've learned is that the one that you can do the least with will make you the most proud, <laughs> you know, if you can survive them. <laughs> so if there is a karma to all of this, I think I must have been an axe murderer in a previous life because I've got eight of them just like that, all right? All of whom have their own mind and all who's, that do have their own mind whom I adore and stand back and never try to take it away from them because we also learned in our studies when I was writing What Do You Really Want for Your Children about how to apply these principles to the raising of children, we discovered that the ones that uh, are raised on blind obedience and are taught to do exactly what they're told and never question anything are the ones who have the highest degree of prejudice as they grow up in their life. And why not? <laughs> they're taught to prejudge. You know, you're supposed to think this way. You're a Bosnian, you're supposed to hate a Serb. You're a Muslim, you're supposed to hate a Jew. You're a Hindi, you're supposed to hate a Sikh. It's, you know, and then you just ra you raise them to not think for themselves, to get into this no-think mentality. And so I honor my scurvy elephants. And there was one named Samuel Taylor Coleridge who took on kings and queens and so on up in the uh, uh, eastern part of the United States a uh, hundred or so years ago. And um, this is one of his great poems. And I'd like you to just, uh, as I just say it to you, uh, I'd like you to really banish the doubt. I'd like you to just, just let it in. Do what we used to have to do in, in poetry classes when I was studying English literature. We used to, they used to tell us that um, you have to have this willing suspension of disbelief. You know, when you go to a movie theater and there's a two-dimensional screen there, and you know that this is just lights flickering on and off in a screen. It's just, it's not real. And you don't go in there and say, well, this is ridiculous. Those are just lights, and those aren't people, and look at this. I can put my hand in there. You don't do that because you wouldn't be able to get anything out of it. So what you do is you suspend your disbelief, and you allow yourself for a couple of hours to be entertained, and then you walk out and you say, ah, that was so phony, they didn't do this, and those were... So while you're in it, so what I'd like you to do for the remainder of time that we have is just suspend that disbelief and just listen to this. This is what Coleridge said. He said, what if you slept? And what if in your sleep you dreamed? And what if in your dream you went to heaven and there picked a strange and wonderful flower? And what if when you awoke you held that flower in your hand? What then? I wonder how many of you know that such a thing is impossible, to bring something from dreaming consciousness into waking consciousness. And if that knowing is so pervasive that you can't allow yourself to entertain the notion that even the least among you can do all that I have done, that you have it within you as a people, as a species, there's a collective unconsciousness in the world. 
One of the things that I've committed myself to talking about is a very simple thing that what we all came in here knowing today about AIDS. What do we know about AIDS? What do we know? What have we been bombarded with for the past 10 years about AIDS? If you get it, you what? You die. We all know that. You can all say it in unison. And you know, if you took and look in, inside in the new technology today, you look at a, an atom, and they have these electron microscopes now where they can literally take an atom and they can take these, you know how they have these electrons and protons and crutons and neutrons and whatever they are that you had to measure when you were in junior high school, remember? You can now take those uh, electrons, these little tiny subatomic particles that uh, are hurling around through these massive empty spaces, and you can begin to align them. And as you align them and align them and get them in a line, when you get to what they call a critical mass, when you get to that point, let's say whatever it is, if there's a billion of them in there and you get to two million, you, there's this like invisible force that is inside of this atom that all of a sudden overwhelms the atom and all of the rest of the electrons in there are automatically aligned. And they call this place, they call this a critical mass. And they call this, in, in quantum physics, they call this phase transition. When you hit the critical mass, all the rest of them, through this invisible force, begin to align. And quantum physics is nothing more than the study of how things behave at this subatomic level. And what we've discovered is that we're made up of these things, so that when enough of us, as a people, begin to think in certain kinds of ways, and we reach a critical mass, then all the rest of us begin to align that way. And the same kind of changes that take place in the history of humanity in one place take place all over the planet at the same time. Like slavery began to be stopped about the middle of the 19th century, not just in Africa and here, but in Asia and in, and in Indonesia and all over the planet because the consciousness began to shift that this was no longer something we could tolerate. And as people began to think this way, it's called the hundredth monkey effect where they will take these monkeys and they will teach them how to wash sweet potatoes over here and all of them will watch each other doing it in what they call a lelomimetic behavior where they will mimic each other and then when they reach the critical mass all the rest of them are suddenly doing the same thing and then they go over to this island over here 200 miles away where they haven't even had any contact with the same monkeys and the same species and they're doing the same thing. That the spread is not a physical uh, uh, property, that it's an invisible property. That indeed we are all connected, but what we're connected with is not something that we can get a hold of. As Deepak always says, quantum physics is not only stranger than you think it is, it's stranger than you can think. <laughs> because it indeed, what it does is it shatters the illusion of our separateness. So that if enough of us begin to believe that something is intolerable, and we really begin to act on that and think that way and create that because collectively the same thing is true. The state of your life is nothing more than a reflection of your state of mind and the state of the world is nothing more than a collective state of mind. It's a state of mind. We act collectively on what we think about. And so the massive changes that you've seen taking place on this planet over the past uh, three or four years, I mean the, the falling of dictatorships in the Philippines, and in Nicaragua, and in Romania, and Bulgaria, the falling of the Berlin Wall, the, uh, the, the crises uh, were all resolved, almost all of them, without even a bullet being shed. It wasn't as if all the people who were in power suddenly got together and said, you know, we really shouldn't be treating people this way. This isn't nice. The new consciousness came about because enough of us began to align ourselves, and out of that alignment come new leaders. A poet elected to the presidency, Václav Havel, in Czechoslovakia, who was imprisoned just a decade ago <laughs> for his beliefs. Lech Walesa, elected democratic president, the, the, the solidarity leader in Poland, elected to be the president. And all of these changes that we've seen taking place, sweeping across the country, and the dismantling of apartheid on another part of the one song, and over here on another part, a million students in Tenement Square. You think it's an accident? It's a spiritual revolution. It comes from a new consciousness. And those changes that you're seeing taking place are so powerful, and indeed, we've got to shift that awareness in what we believe about disease and about AIDS, particularly about AIDS. And I've been talking about this now for four or five months, and I'm already beginning to see a shift. Here's Carl Simonton. And 
not a new age foo-foo, but indeed a medical practitioner who back in the 60s was teaching cancer patients how to lower their remission rates through the use of visualization and imagery and teaching them that they had within them the power to rid themselves of these diseases, that it wasn't something that you were assigned to death with. And he's being asked this question in an interview on New Dimensions Radio, and I bring it so I give it to you exact. He says, one of the things I often say is that the media can be damaging to your health. He said, if you watch or read the news, it can be very negative and hopeless, encouraging. And here's Carl Simonson's reply to the interview. He says, absolutely, we saw that with AIDS. He says, I treated my first AIDS patient way before 1981, before the symptom complex was known as AIDS, and he had gotten well. He said, the first two people with AIDS that I worked with got well very quickly. Yet what came out routinely in the media was a universally fatal disease because it was more sensational, it was more dramatic, and the disservice this did to people with, who were afflicted with this condition was immense. Imagine that. I mean, we have been bombarded constantly with a message that we cannot do anything about this. This is a universally fatal disease. Why have we believed it? Why do we buy into that? Why would we get rid of something called hope? I mean, hope is the great healer. And if we have that, and we have this divine energy flowing through us, why would we for a second believe that we can't do anything about it? What a horrible thing for us to even begin to adopt as a people. And yet we did, and we, we saw the results. And now, as the consciousness is changing, we're beginning to see, I was down in Australia looking at Time magazine, and there's a sub-headline in a story about it, immunity to AIDS. And it says that fully 5% of the people who contact HIV will not get the AIDS virus, will not get it. They have, and most of them were meditators. Bernie used to talk to me last night at dinner about this. He said, I used to carry around names and addresses of people who were healed from AIDS. And when anybody would say that to him, I'd say, call this person. And yet you don't hear about that because we have a disasterizing consciousness. We want to disasterize about it. We want to make it a catastrophe because it's more newsworthy. We've got to change our awareness around. There's no one, not one person in here ought to ever believe that anything is incurable. There have been plagues that have affected mankind since the beginning, and we have always transcended them. And we will here, we always will, because the divineness that is in each one of us has no doubt. Look, if I have a simple tulip bulb in my hand, and I ask you to look at it and say, what is it? You'd say, well, it's just a, a grungy mass of biological matter. I say, but look at it more closely. And if it gets nurtured in a certain way, that is, it's watered and put in the ground, it will become a tulip bulb. Why? Because it has built into it a future pull. A future pull that you can't see or dissect or find in any lab. It has a future pull, a picture that is part of its DNA, part of its genetic inheritance. If you take a liver cell, from your liver and look at it and dissect it and, and it has a future pull. It will always be a liver cell. It will never be anything else. In order for you to be able to manifest magic, real magic in your life, miracles, you must first be able to conceive of it. You must be able to conceive of it and that means no doubt. And the doubt comes by shifting to a knowing rather than a belief. All of the stuff, Deepak and I are talking now about taking a group, making a movie, and taking in this movie a group of babies that are, a, that say, a hundred of them. And as they are born, we remove them from the environment that they're in, orphans and so on, children who are to be abandoned, and we place them into a world where there is no doubt where they get past the lie. You know, we're led to believe a lie, as William Blake said in his wonderful poem, Songs of Innocence. He said, to see the world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, to hold eternity in the palm of your hand and infinity in an hour, we are led to believe a lie. 
when we see wit not through the eye, which was born in a night to perish in a night, when the soul slept in beams of light. All of us are born in a night to perish in a night in the physical world. But the soul, the spirit, resides and sleeps in formless beams of light. We are led to believe a lie, a huge lie. And the lie is that there are limitations in our life. Imagine these little children being raised in a world where doubt and impossible and can't do are never exposed to that. Anything that they can conceive of in their mind, they're able to practice. They go to fire putting out school, 101. And in fire putting out school, here's a fire over here, and you sit here, and you work on it with your mind. And you put that fire out. You know what my kids and I do after dinner? Many times after dinner in the evenings, a couple times a week, we go out and we put blankets on the grass. And in the blankets on the grass, we uh, look up at the sky. And we kids say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make clouds. Who wants to make clouds? I want to make clouds, Daddy. I want to make clouds. <laughs> I'm going to make a rabbit. These, my kids, all, my, all the people in the neighborhood think that my kids are neurotic. <laughs> Those dire kids think they can make clouds. Why not? The same intelligence that flows through them flows through the clouds. Why not shatter the illusion of your separateness and believe that? Imagine a whole curriculum, a whole world in which you were raised to know that there was no doubt. And you can transcend that doubt. And when you do, you begin to see that miracles, synchronicity, become very much a part of your life. The second of those three things, as I said, when I get to the end, I sort of rush through the last couple, is that you have to learn how to shut down the inner dialogue. Banish the doubt, shut down the inner dialogue. And what is the inner dialogue? The constant repetition in your mind of that chatter that goes on endlessly, it is nothing more than your inventory of beliefs, all of which have doubt attached to them, and all of the things that you're offended by, and all of the judgments that you have. You have to shut it down. If you want to know God, as Melville said, the one and only voice of God is silence. You have got to know that deep within you, your mind is like a pond, like dropping a pebble into a pond. And you drop the pebble in, and at the surface are all the disturbances. And in your mind, that's the chatter. That's the endless repetition of the beliefs and the things that offend you and your judgments, endlessly repeating, repeating, and repeating, over and over and over again. You get to a place where you get peaceful, Call it meditation, call it prayer, it doesn't matter. You make it a regular part of your life. Blaise Pascal, the great French philosopher, once said that uh, all of man's troubles stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Most of us can't do that. We're so hung up on chatter in our inventory and in our beliefs. The pebble drops in its layers, and it drops past chatter to analysis, A-N-A-L, analysis, all right? All that anal retentive stuff, constant picking apart the intellectual violence of tearing everything apart, it drops to synthesis. Instead of looking at, I can do this when I'm troubled by something, I can see the pebble in my meditation just dropping, chatter, no. Why did she do that? Why would she say that? Why would she do that? Blah, blah, blah. And I would be thinking about why would my wife do this? Why would one of my kids do that? And then I could just feel the pebble dropping and I'd get to a place called synthesis, where instead of seeing how things are pulled apart, you see how they're held together. And now I see that, you know, my wife and I are one and my children are one and we're all one and this is one family. And it's like all of the analysis and the chatter is gone. And then you get to a point where the pebble drops a little further. And as the pebble drops, you begin to quiet your mind. And now there's no analysis or synthesis. It's like quiet. And ultimately, ultimately, the pebble drops in a place called the unified field, where you empty your mind. 
And in the unified field, St. Mark put it this way, to he that knoweth, all things are possible. Now what does that leave out? Nothing. In the unified field, it's called a unified field of all possibilities. You're always in the right place at the right time. In this peaceful place within you, God will show up. And you will know that you're not alone. You will know that if prayer is called, if what you do when you talk to God is called prayer, you will know that your intuition is God talking to you. You will see and experience and know. And as you do, you'll start observing in your life things that I call synchronicity, where you'll see that a thought that you have about someone or something will begin to be manifested. It will happen for you over and over again. It happened to me this afternoon when I was running down to Venice Beach and back, a place where they're filled with scurvy elephants. <laughs> and I was thinking about a man named Greg Anderson who wrote a book called The Cancer Conqueror, who, which I have endorsed and which I believe in, and which I have uh, purchased by the caseload and given to people who have cancer. And I was thinking about him, and I know that he had just been on, he's got a new book out, and I was, and he had asked for an endorsement and I had given it. He was talking about some of the things I had said on Good Morning America. And I was thinking about all of this and I stopped. There was a little man dancing over there on Venice Beach who looked like he had, it was a thalidomide baby. And uh, he had like fingers growing out of his shoulders and he was dancing there for money. And I stopped running and I reached into my pocket to, uh, to give him something and to say hello to him and to know, remind myself that the same spirit is in him that is in me. That, He's not his form. It's to me, those people and all of those, those people who are in those things called disabilities are really wonderful reminders that, uh, that our form is nothing more than our curriculum to God. And there's the fullness of God is in him and me, and I remind myself to, to stop and share. And he was so grateful. And this woman said she had been chasing me, her and her husband, and she was all out of breath. She said, and you stopped, and I never stop when I'm running. I did this time, and she started talking to me, and she said, I just wanted to thank you for my brother. My, my brother is Greg Anderson, and he was yesterday on the, on the on Good Morning America show talking about his new book and you. And it's like that had been in my mind, and there was the sister manifested right there for me this afternoon. Those things become a regular part of your consciousness when you get to the unified field. You'll be thinking about your sister, and all of a sudden, she will call, and you haven't talked to her in five years. You'll find yourself having these experiences, meditating your way through a tennis match. One time I was meditating my way through a tennis match, and I went for a ball that everyone said was impossible to get, and for sure I couldn't have gotten to it. It was hit so hard, and I just took off. And I was in that zone, I was in what they call flow, where you just get to this ecstasy place, which meditation gives you. And I just took off and left my body, it seemed like. <laughs> and reached out and hit that ball and hit it back for a winner. And everyone turned around and said, what happened? How could you, could never have gotten to that ball? I said, you're not going to believe this. But the ball waited in midair for me to get there. <laughs> you see, you laugh, and it means that there's still doubt there. If I tell that same story to a group full of uh, quantum physicists, there's not a snicker. They said, of course, because the mind is capable of anything. All things are possible, even moving mountains in the unified field. When you get to that place where you've shut down the inner dialogue and banished the doubt, you'll begin to experience these miracles that you visualized earlier and conceived of. And finally, the third thing, and the thing I'm going to write my next book about, is called Conquering the Ego, or Slaying Your Self-Importance. And slaying your self-importance is really about understanding that the ego part of you is nothing more than the action of your beliefs in your physical world. He's better than me, she's better than me, they offend me, this is wrong, I don't like what they're doing, I have to be better than somebody else, we're number one. You're, it's the endless repetition of your self-importance being put out there which interferes with your ability to be on purpose. You see, if your life is on purpose, and it is, is an intelligent universe that we're all a part of, it means that when you come in, you come in with nothing, and you leave with 
nothing. So if you can have nothing while you're here, the measure of your life is not in your duration, but in its donations. How you measure, the only thing you can do with your life is give it away. That's all you can do, is give it away. To be on purpose, you have shifted off of your own self-importance, whether you're a salesman, whether you're a cab driver, whether you're a parent, the perfect metaphor for what we're here for is a nursing mother giving of herself and her body freely, asking nothing in return. Asking nothing in return. Just giving. And when you do that in your business and you shift your awareness off of what's in it for me and you get off of your ego and say, how may I reach, how may I help you, how may I serve, and let go of all the things that offend you. The wonderful concluding story that I have is of Carlos Castaneda tells in The Power of Silence. And he is walking with his student. Carlos is his student. Don Juan is the teacher. And he has been studying with him for years to become inaugural, a spiritual master who can do all of those things I earlier alluded to that are impossible. Changing shape, being in more than one place at one time moving about the planet through consciousness. All things you'll begin to see more and more of as we change from a doubting philosophy to a knowing philosophy. And they're in the mountains of northern Mexico and suddenly they look around and there's a jaguar over there to the left. And this jaguar is chasing them and Don Juan says to his student, you see that jaguar? He's going to eat you. He wants you for dinner. And when he catches up with us, he will eat you and not me. And he says, but how can you be so sure? He said, because I know when he gets here that I can leave. And you believe you can. And for three days, they are chased by this jaguar. And he has this enormous fear. And just when he thinks he's escaped, he looks and it's a little closer. And imagine yourself in the position, as you sit here, of having an animal that has much more speed and alacrity and who can read your thoughts being this far away, and imagine yourself being eaten by this thing <laughs> to know his level of fear. And finally, after three days, he manages to escape. And they get to this cliff, and they sit on the top of the cliff, and uh, Don Juan says to Carlos, he says, tell me, he said, during the three days that you were being chased by the jaguar, he said, were you offended by the jaguar? He said, no, he said, I wasn't offended. He was just a jaguar doing what he's doing. I just wanted to get out of his way and get on with my life. He said, that's how you have to learn to treat the onslaughts of all of your fellow human beings. You have to understand that they are on their path, doing what they're doing, not be offended and get out of their way and stay on purpose. Or as Thoreau put it, you have to learn to advance confidently in the direction of your own dreams and endeavor to live the life which you have imagined. And when you do, you will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. It will chase after you when you get on purpose. Your miracle that I ask you to conceive of will arrive in your life and more. I promise it's happened for me happened with my family, and I give a lot of examples in real magic. When you banish the doubt, shut down that inner dialogue and get peaceful and surrender, and get rid of your self-importance. Because my friends, when you learn to trust in yourself, what you're doing is you're learning to trust in the very wisdom that created you. God bless you, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you.